Understanding how variables are related to each other is an important part of the exploratory data analysis workflow. This is commonly achieved through a number of different plots, including scatter plots and line plots, and these are often built up using Matplotlib or Seaborn or one of the many other Python plotting libraries. Additionally, it's also common to display a plot where each of the categories that you're trying to look at and investigate is split up so that you can see the individual relationships between the variables or the features and that target feature. Hey friends, I'm Andy, and if you already knew that, then welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to look at the Seaborn rel plot. The rel plot, as the name suggests, allows us to identify relationships or if there are no relationships between the features within our data set. And we can do this through the scatter plot or through a line plot. And that can be achieved by changing one simple argument within the function call. Not only that, the rel plot also incorporates Seaborn's facet grid functionality, which allows us to split the data up into individual charts depending on the category that we use. So let's go over to our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can create some relational plots using the Seaborn library. So now that we are in our Jupyter Notebook, the first thing we're going to do is import the libraries that we're going to use. And for this, we're going to use Seaborn, which is imported as SNS, and we're also going to import pandas, which is imported as PD. We can then load in the data set that we're going to work with, and this data set is from one of the wells within the Zeek Enforce 2020 machine learning competition data set. And it's one well from about 100 wells from the Norwegian continental shelf. So I've also added in an argument here for any underscore values, which will convert any values of minus 999, which is a common missing value indicator within well log data, and it's going to convert that to an NAN value. And this just makes it easier when we work with the data later on. Once we've imported the data, we can quickly view the header of the data, and we can see the different columns that we have within that data set. We have our group information information, as well as some well logging curves and a lithology curve. So to begin plotting the data within a relational plot in Seaborn, we need to call upon sns.relplot, and we need to pass in a data argument. Where is our data coming from? In this case, it will be our data frame, which is df. We then need to specify the x values that we're going to be plotting, and we're going to select n phi from our table. And for the y values, we're going to select row b. And then at the end, I will add a semicolon, which will then suppress some of the messages that we commonly see when we're running plots within Jupyter Notebooks. So when we run that, we get a nice scatter plot back. We've got a row B on the Y axis and N phi on the X axis. So typically when viewing this data, we usually view the Y axis in an inverse order where we have the higher values at the bottom and the lower values at the top. So to do this, we need to take the code here and put it into a new cell. We need to assign this code to a variable. In this case, I'm going to assign it to the letter G. And then at the end, I'm going to put in a new line whilst moving that semicolon to the next line and type in g.set and then ylim is equal to 3 to 1.5. And that will just reverse the order of the axis whilst also setting the limits for it. And we can run that and we get the same scatter plot back, but now it is inverted on the y axis. So now we can begin customizing the scatter plot. So we can add some coloring based on one of the other variables within the data set. So I'm going to use the code that we have here and paste that in here. And then what we're going to do is set a variable called hue. And we will set that to gr or gamma ray. And we can run this and we get back the same plot that we had before, but you'll see that it is now colored differently. Instead of the blue points, we now have a range of values from these sort of peach points to the more dark purple points. And with this data, we've got quite high values within it, up to 750 API, which is abnormally high. So we could exclude them, or we could set in a, a limit. And we can do hue underscore norm is equal to 0 to 150. And that just normalizes the colors, and then we can see the variation as much better. We can see we've got our high gamma ray values here, and our low gamma ray values down here in our, in our cleaner lithologies. But one problem with this is that we are just normalizing the hue to these values here, and this could be 0 to 1, or any other value that we, we have within our data. 
but when we do that, we can see that the labels or the legend does not update to reflect this. So that's one thing to bear in mind when doing that. We can choose another curve that is commonly used and that is the caliper curve. And we can use this to identify where we have potential washout within our data and thereby exclude that data from further analysis if we find that that data is severely impacted. So when we run this, we can then see that we've got high caliper values up here and low caliper values down here. So this doesn't necessarily mean that this is all washed out as we could be in a larger borehole size. So for example, 12 and a quarter or 17 and a half inch borehole. And then these values relate to that borehole size. So you would be best calculating what's known as a differential caliper where you're taking the caliper minus the bit size and then you can use those values to know whether you've got significant washout that's independent of the hole size. So now that we've colored by a continuous variable, we can also color by a categorical variable. And if I take the same code that we have above and we change this hue variable from Kali to our lif variable, which is our lifology. And as we can see above in the data frame, we can see that we've got values uh, or text values. Here we've got shale, but there are a number of other values in here, such as sandstone and hydrite and limestone, etc. So when we run this, instead of having this continuous color scale, what we're going to get is discreetly colored intervals or sections. So we can see here that we've got our shale intervals here, and we've also got our sandstone shale in the orange and the sandstone points here in the green. So down here in the bottom left, we can see that we've got a mixture of limestone, chalk and marl. If you're plotting this figure in black and white, it can be very difficult to distinguish between these colors. So what we can do is add some shapes to represent each of these lithologies. And that is done by passing in the style argument. And if we set that to left, then run that, we get back a scatter plot where we've got a mixture of different shapes. So we've got our circle, our cross, square, and another cross that just rotated differently. And this can sometimes help us distinguish between the different lithologies. So the other great thing about the relational plot is not only does it allow you to do a scatter plot, it allows you to do a line plot. And we can create a line plot of, say, one of our measurements versus depth simply by creating a variable called g and then assigning it to sns.relplot. And we again pass the data in as df. Our x is going to be equal to depth underscore md. This is our depth curve. And our y variable is going to be equal to, let's say, gamma ray. And at the end, pass in the argument kind. So at the moment, by default, when you use the rel plot, it will default to a scatter plot. If we want to use a line plot, we would need to specify line. If we set the axis limits, we can do that by using g.set and passing in y lim is equal to 0 to 150. And then add a semicolon at the end, and we can run that. And what we get back is a simple gamma ray versus depth plot. So everything here looks all squished up. What we can do is change the size of our figure. There are a number of ways that we can change the size of the figure. And the simplest way when using rel plot is first to specify a height, and we will set this to say seven. And then we set the aspect value to two. And this should take, it, should take the height multiplied by two. And when we run that, we get back a much bigger plot we can see that we've got it is much taller and it is also much wider. So we can start to see a bit more variation within our data. So one of the great things about the rel plot compared to say doing something in matplotlib is that you can very simply split the data up into multiple columns and multiple rows based on one of the variables within your data frame. So what I'm going to do now is just paste the code in that we had above and you can see that we've got the hue set to lithology and our x and y variables set to nphi and row b. So perhaps we want to see individually each of these lithologies on their own scatter plot or cross plot. And we can do that by creating an argument called call and then setting that to lif. So that when we run this, what we get back is several subplots where we've got the individual lithologies, where we've got say shale, sandstone shale, etc., all the way down to chalk. And we can see each of these much more clearly compared to a single scatter plot where everything is on top of each other.
However, it's very difficult to read this. What we can do is pass in another argument called call underscore wrap. And if I set this to free, for instance, we can then get back the same plot that we have here. However, we can see that it's split into three columns and this just makes it a little bit easier to visualize. So we can see that we've got a shale, sandstone shale, sandstone, and we can actually read the labels compared to this figure up here. So this is great if you're wanting to include this in a presentation where you want to make it readable and visible. Finally, if we want to increase the size of our points on these plots, or we can pass in S and then we set that to a value. So if I set that to 100 and run that, we then get back the plots with much larger points. And this just helps it stand out a little bit more when you're starting to look at these plots. So one other good thing about the rel plot is we can split the data into columns and also into rows. However, this makes it harder to visualize the data when you see this in a second. So if I say row is equal to group, which is our geological grouping, and run that, when the cell runs, we can see that we get back a much smaller plot where we've got seven columns and seven rows. So each of these rows, it's a little bit hard to visualize. So I've opened it here in a new tab. So what you can see here is we've got the lithologies, shale, sandstone, shale, sandstone, limestone, tuff, etc. Along the, the columns, but along the rows, you've got the individual geological groupings. So here we've got Nordland, Horderland, Rogaland, etc. as we go down. And we can see that, for example, within this the Shetland group here, we don't have any shales. However, we do have a sandstone shale and we have a little bit of sandstone as well as predominantly limestone. And as you scroll further down, we can see in the Cromer Knoll group, there's very little data points within here, which suggests that the, this interval is very thin and may not have very much information within it. So we've only got a handful of points here within the sandstone shale grouping. If we go further down to the Hegra group, we can see that we've got more sandstone shale points and sandstones. So you can see the variation in geology as you go through the different geological groupings. And there we have it. We've seen how to create some relational plots using the Seaborn library and using the rel plot functionality. We have seen how to create scatter plots and also a line plot by changing a simple argument in the function. And we've also seen how we can split that data up into individual plots based on categories. If you've enjoyed today's video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content from this channel, be sure to click that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So thanks for watching, and until next time, bye for now.